So now we want to talk about different types of science. There's discovery-based science, and then there's what you've probably already heard about in high school, hypothesis-based science. But well, let's start with discovery. Discovery-based science is we are trying to observe the natural world without preconceptions. It's very self-explanatory. You look, cool, you see a thing. The purpose of discovery-based science is you are trying to discover new things. But when we're discovering new things, it's hard to guess what's out there. So that the goal here is you just want to see as much as possible. Um, astronomers do this all the time. They just want to look at a different part of the sky. Um, unfortunately, sometimes it's really hard to get funding for this type of science because we don't know what the application it will be. We don't know what we'll find. We can make some guesses based on knowledge we already have, but the purpose here is we want to discover something brand new. And this is really the precursor to any other science. And so many beautiful things have been discovered out here. Um, this was the basis for Victoria naturalists and all their weird collecting habit habits. They were just fascinated with what was out there. And that's our question. We just want to see and discover more cool things. But once we've made some observations, now we can start to make some predictions. And that's where hypothesis-based science comes in. So here, we want to discover reliable information because we are manipulating our environment. We are molding, we are changing, so we can learn something new in this way. Um, here you can see in this comic, a normal person, when there is a podium that zaps you with lightning, probably wouldn't do it again. But a scientist will wonder if that happens every time. Our process when we're doing hypothesis-based science looks a little bit like this. We, of course, start with those observations, but Games have been around for a little bit. There's a lot of knowledge that's already out there. So we can observe ourselves, but we can also observe through researching what other people have already seen. And once you have that in observations, that kind of base knowledge, now you can come up with a question. And from that question, you want to come up with a hypothesis. And that hypothesis should lead to a very specific prediction. If this happens, then I expect to see this other thing. And with that prediction, you create an experiment with which to test it. Now, after you test, you have two options. It could be supported. You saw what you thought you would saw. That's great. Um, then you can go back and you can make another prediction. Can you flesh it out? Can you get, um, understand more aspects of the thing you're looking at? More often than not, your hypothesis isn't supported. And then you have to go all the way back up to your hypothesis and revise that and try again. And don't feel bad. It's just how science works. We try a lot of things that are wrong before we figure out what's actually going on. And let's talk about this hypothesis. This is a very important word. And we want to understand what it means. So here, it, think of it as an educated guess. It, we are trying to explain what's going on, but we haven't tested it yet. It is just based on our research. So we have a pretty good idea, but we need to confirm it. Um, and the goal here is you want it to explain the things you observe. So here, there's two hypotheses. Either the spider grew or they shrunk. There's a couple of qualities that we want to make sure that all hypotheses have. First, they need to be logical. They should make sense. Um, we, they want to be falsifiable. Um, we also want them to be consistent with what we already know especially since there's been so many things already done, already discovered, we want to make sure that you're fitting into that framework of hundreds of years of science. Um, and we also want them to be simple. But let's start with falsifiable. What does this mean? Falsifiable just means that there are conditions under which you can disprove this hypothesis. So in this example, a miracle in the middle, you can't really disprove that. But let's look at an example. So here are two statements. First, no alien spaceships have ever crashed in New Mexico. Second, an alien spaceship crashed in New Mexico. These are about the same topic. Take a moment, which one do you think is falsifiable? So here are our answers. The first one is falsifiable and the second one is not. Let's look at why. So first, um, no alien spaceships have ever crashed in New Mexico. If we ever find a part of an alien spaceship, then that statement is false. So there are possible conditions under which we can disprove that statement. Still not likely to happen, 
but there are conditions which it can be disproven. The second one, an alien spaceship crashed in New Mexico. If it's really wrong, there's only absence of evidence, so we're never really gonna be able to disprove it. So this is one of the instances where you wanna make sure you're a little bit careful with your language and how you're forming your hypothesis. But next, let's talk about these predictions. A good hypothesis is meaningful. <laughs> um, we, we want it to have applicable predictions to you know, make meaningful sense of the world, word. I'm not particularly knowledgeable about string theory, but a lot of people like to uh, poke fun at it because what's the point? Well, who cares? Um, and lastly, we do want our hypotheses to have simple explanations. If they're too complicated, when are we going to use them? Um, so there's two principles here. The first is Occam's razor. One should not increase beyond what is necessary the number of entities required to explain anything. It really just means simple is better. And related is parsimony. So if you have multiple explanations that are possible, you want to choose the explanation that requires you to take the fewest leaps of logic. We use this especially when we're talking about phylogenetics. So when we test these hypotheses, people aren't, you know, particularly motivated to disprove their own theories. But people are very motivated to disprove the theories of other people. And this is really how modern science works. We have a lot of different people, a lot of different labs. They're all trying to disprove each other because they want to be on top. But this provides a really rich ground to make sure things are constantly tested over and over again. So even if something is published that um, wasn't correct, someone will figure it out really soon. But let's also talk about what a theory is. This is another really important word, which uh, is occasionally loaded in modern day. A theory is larger than a hypothesis. It's actually a collection of related hypotheses. And these have been rigorously tested. So if something is a scientific theory, it's pretty darn strong. Let's look at some examples. Gravity, electromagnetic theory, atomic theory, the theory of relativity, and my personal favorite, evolution. Um, sometimes people throw around the term, it's just a theory, especially when we're talking about evolution. But really, a theory is a very strong set of related hypotheses that they're consistent with each other. They all talk about one larger thing, and a theory is something that's pretty strong. So keep in mind that we use theory a little bit differently in science than how most people use it colloquially.